Hello, I am Dr. Ibn Awaf from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of German Islamic University. I would like to present this lecture on skin and subcutaneous swellings. And the main objective is to make the students fully oriented on short cases that they might meet in the OSCE and OSPI exams. I'm going to speak about lumps arising from the skin itself and uh, lumps arising from subcutaneous fat and fibrous tissue uh, tumors and tumors arising or masses arising from the uh, nervous tissue, capillaries, arteries, and veins uh, below the skin. First, the cyst in the skin layers, like the epidermoid cyst. Epidermoid cyst is an inclusion cyst. Uh, it occurs in, it arises inside the layers of the skin, and usually it is different in contents. You cannot separate the skin. It is not behind the skin. You cannot separate the skin. You cannot grip the skin over it. Uh, the inclusion cyst has different contents, like a sweat, uh, gland, inclusion cyst, retention cyst, uh, containing uh, fluid and subvaceous cyst, which contain sebum, which is a thick whitish material. The subvaceous cyst is characterized by a black dot at its apex. It is called punctum, and usually it is a smooth, and rounded, and uh, it is not tender because it is small. It is a cyst, but it's, it is difficult to uh, demonstrate. Uh, Transformination test because of the thick material and difficult to do a fluctuation test because it is small. However, if it gets inflamed, it will become tender and it might rupture, releasing this whitish thick material. Also, in the skin itself, extravasation of chemotherapy might cause problems. The symptoms first the patient feels pain, redness, swelling, itching, or mild burning at the area of the leakage of chemotherapy. And sometimes they may develop thrombophilibitis or rarely peripheral nerve palsy. And the, some, sometimes the skin might undergo necrosis like what is seen in this photo here. And the causes of the leakage or extravasation of chemotherapy is that the nerves uh, injecting the material might be inexperienced member of a staff. And probably there is a high flow pressure from an IV fluid containing the chemotherapy in a weak vein that ruptures, releasing the chemotherapy in the soft tissues or multiple attempts of cannulations puncturing the vessels itself. And uh, the treatment is usually analgesics and regular dressings uh, over the uh, site of the leakage. In the skin itself, we can find like this here in this baby, also here. It is also here. This is a birthmark of a hemangioma. It is a tuft of capillaries. It is a bare mark. If it is small, it might disappear with time. But if it is big, probably laser can be used for treatment. Then the subcutaneous swellings. I will start with lipoma. Lipoma is a subcutaneous swelling. You can grasp the skin over it. It is usually rounded, smooth. It is very soft. It is a uh, one can demonstrate uh, a fluctuation test positive, uh, but there is no uh, transformination, negative for transformination. 
uh, it is always behind the skin. It is always uh, painless and smooth and not tender. However, it might become multiple. Some patients may develop multiple lipomas. It arises anywhere in the body, at all layers of the body. But here we are dealing with subcutaneous swellings like this over the shoulder and here behind the shoulder blade and here in the scalp behind the ear. And the treatment, if it causes symptoms or disfigurement can be uh, removed surgically. Now, the second common subcutaneous swelling is the abscess. And the abscess is usually painful collection of pus. And it is caused by bacterial infection. Uh, it can develop anywhere in the body. Pus is made up of living and dead white blood cells and bacteria and exudate and dead necrotic tissue in one pocket or multi loculated abscess. Like seen here, this is an abscess. It's about to rupture. Again, this is an abscess here. This is a breast abscess also pointing here. And the commonest area for subcutaneous abscess are in the axilla, uh, perianal region, breast, hands, and feet. However, it can occur anywhere inside the body or in the subcutaneous tissue. If not treated, the pus will spread uh, through hematogenous spread and cause systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And that is uh, septicemia. And the treatment usually it is surgical drainage by de-roofing, taking part of the skin away to keep the wound uh, open and cure touch of the abscess wall and pack the abscess with gauze and regular dressings to let the wound heal by secondary intention. And one of the commonest swellings in the subcutaneous tissue is a ganglion. This is a ganglion here over behind. It is behind the skin. You can grasp the skin over it. Uh, the ganglion is a cyst and uh, it is commonly developed in the wrist or along the tendons. It is rounded or oval. It is a smooth and usually it is not tender. And it is filled with jelly-like uh, fluid. Uh, or, but because it is a small, it might be difficult to, to demonstrate uh, fluctuation tests. But uh, one can demonstrate a transillumination test. As a treatment, if it causes pain or restriction of movement or disfigurement, can be removed surgically. But usually, it, it might get connected with the joint capsule. Now, the fourth subcutaneous uh, swelling is a cystic hygroma. And it is a sort of lymphangioma, collection of lymph fluid that appears as soft commonly in the head and neck region of an infant, like here. And it is usually painless, and it is unilateral and can be bilateral with positive fluctuation test and brilliant positive transillumination test. Uh, as complication, it might become infected, or it can cause compression symptoms in the neck, particularly for breathing. And the treatment is usually surgical excision. This is a line of the surgical incision and removal of the uh, cystic hygroma. Now, in, in the fibrous layer of the investing layer behind the skin and behind the subcutaneous fat, tumors might arise from the fibrous tissue. And this could be a fibroma or neurofibroma and neuromas from nerves and nerve sheath. And uh, benign, it is a fibroma is usually benign and it is composed of dense fibrous tissue within collagenous stroma. It is like here. And it could be neuroma. This could be neuroma because these are the nerves passing to the toes. This could be a neuroma and it is usually uh, symptomless, 
It is benign, however, it can cause pain. And uh, uh, it, it might be inherited in uh, uh, neurofibromatosis, like this one. And the treatment, if it is big or causing disfigurement, then it can be removed surgically. And if it is in uh, an important part, for example, like the ear, it can cause hearing problems or it can cause blindness if it is in the eye, in the optic nerve, neuroma of the optic nerve. Now, thyroid, thyroglossal cyst. Thyroglossal cyst is an embryonic remnant of failure of closure of the thyroglossal duct. The thyroglossal duct usually extends from the uh, in the, along the midline from the foramen cecum, which lies between the anterior two thirds and the posterior one third of the tongue. And it goes down to the neck across the hyoid bone to the isthmus of the thyroid gland. And it is usually full of mucoid fluid and may get infected and ruptured to form a thyroglossal uh, fistula. And here is the thyroglossal fistula. This is a thyroglossal cyst. On examination, usually it is a midline cyst in the anterior aspect of the neck, and it is not tender and it moves with swallowing and get elevated with protrusion of the tongue. In this case, one should ask the patient to open the mouth. The examiner should, ho should hold the mandible not to move, then request the patient to protrude the tongue. The uh, thyroglossal cyst and thyroglossal fistula will move upwards with protrusion of the tongue. The treatment, usually excision of the whole duct, including part of the hyoid bone to prevent recurrence. Now, arteriovenous fistula, this um, um, might arise because of trauma or might be constricted uh, during surgery, particularly for hemodialysis. And it is a connection between vein, this blue one, and the artery. And usually it causes aneurysmal dilatation of vein to facilitate puncturing for dialysis. Like this one is a blood uh, from the uh, going to the dialysis machine. And here is a blood coming from the dialysis machine. Now also in the uh, subcutaneous or in below, behind the skin uh, arising from vessels, aneurysm might develop or pseudoaneurysm might uh, form. The aneurysm is an abnormal bulge of a blood vessel like here of the popliteal artery. It is a bulge of a vessel. It could be fusiform or it could be in only in one side called sacular aneurysm. And it is usually felt like a, a lump which is pulsatile. It is a pulsatile mass uh, with brewy and thrill. Now, uh, the pseudoaneurysm, usually, if there is a blood leaking from aneurysm or from trauma to an artery or vein or particular artery, and if there is leakage from an, a constructed surgical construction of uh, arteriovenous fistula, this blood leaking will be surrounded by a layer of clotting material that is fibrin and platelets. That means there is no true wall of a vessel, but it's only a layer of fibrin and platelets. This is why it is called false aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm. It is usually also pulsatile mass in the subcutaneous tissue one can grasp the skin, but it is pulsatile behind with a positive brewery and thrill. And uh, the danger or the complication could be rupture leading to severe bleeding. Now, Madura. Madura, usually uh, here we call it Madura foot. It is caused by mycetoma, or we call it mycetoma also. It is a chronic granulomatous infection. It is characterized by subcutaneous masses, like here, subcutaneous masses, and sinuses, like these. And uh, these sinuses will discharge granules. The granules could be black, red, or yellow, or white. 
and uh, it is caused by either caused by fungi, which is eu mycetoma, or by anaerobic filamentous bacteria like actinu mycetoma. The cause is usually a thorn brick in the pasture or in the farm, and inoculation of the organism into the skin or subcutaneous tissue. And uh, it is usually painless masses. Uh, it is firm, and uh, the organism continue to grow, and it might invade the muscles and bones. The geographical distribution of mycetoma is along the uh, savanna region of Africa and uh, America and Asia. And it affects the workers, as I said, in the farm and in pastures, particularly those who work uh, barefooted. But any thorn puncturing the body anywhere, carrying the organism, will cause these uh, Madura uh, mycetomas. Uh, the WHO has recognized mycetoma as a neglected tropical disease because it occurs in regions where medicines are expensive and the diagnosis is made usually late, and there are poor facilities for surgery. The infection can be caused by fungi, we said, in 40% as eumycetoma, or by filamentous bacteria in 60% of cases. So it is caused by fungi and mycetoma. Uh, the uh, color of the grains, as I said before, could be black in uh, eumycetoma and could be red and yellow in actinomycetoma. Uh, if a thorn uh, break the skin anywhere in the back on the Botox or in the scalp or anywhere, then it can cause uh, mycetoma in that region. For investigation, the most important thing is to do a plain X-ray, anthroposterior and lateral, to look for periosteal reaction, bone cyst, and destruction of bone. And uh, also ultrasound might show these subcutaneous masses. And uh, microscopy can be done also, particularly for filaments of fungi or of, of bacteria. Now, the complications, extension, as I said before, uh, destroying the bones and joints and causing periosteitis, osteomyelitis, arthritis, and destruction of bone leading to gross deformities. This is involving the whole foot, and here it is in the dorsum as well as in the plantar surface with some black granules coming out. The treatment is complete surgical excision without spillage of grains. If grains is spilled out uh, of the uh, uh, sacs of the Madura, then definitely there will be a recurrence. So the surgeon should be very careful to do a complete excision without spillage of the grains. And uh, then we should put the patient on the appropriate antibiotics like trimosobrium, and which is uh, and sulfamisoxazole, that is septirine or bacterine, dapsone and uh, uh, septirine in combination. Oh, and rifampicin can be used also in resistant cases. However, ketoconazole and itraconazole are effective also, and they reduce the duration of treatment. Here, it seems this patient is responding to the medical treatment of uh, actinomycetoma. For uh, for uh, Madura, conservative, uh, uh, we should conserve tissues. Uh, if we, if there is bone destruction, we should remove any bone which is destroyed, and we can remove the forefoot as in the previous case, and we leave the calcaneum and talus like in sinus amputation. Later, a special shoe can be worn so that the patient will not be limp. This is a stump here. And uh, also, but in if you compare this to vascular gangrene and in diabetics, uh, usually we go, there is no muscles to cover 
the area of the uh, heel. We go for blow knee amputation, and one can use an artificial limb. This is a blow knee amputation. And to have the calf muscles to cover the bone edge, the cut edge of the bone, and a longer skin also to cover the muscles at the stump of the amputation. Now some questions, uh, particularly OSP for OSP questions to enhance student learning. This is a difficult question for, this is a lady, uh, she's undergoing incision uh, for drainage of uh, breast, right breast abscess. What would be her main symptoms and signs? And what is the expected causative organism in breast abscess? And what would be her post-operative management? How describes the post-operative management? And then how would you advise the patient regarding lactation? This is difficult because she has got an inverted nipple here. It is a communication skill question. It is rather difficult. And the second question is that this is a 60 year old patient who is on hemodialysis. Uh, for renal failure, and he developed a rapid expanding swelling in the right wrist. What is the possible causes of this swelling? You can mention two to three possible uh, swellings. And mention three physical signs that will help reaching the appropriate diagnosis. And what is the major complication he might develop if not treated? And also a communication skill question, how would you explain for him that he needs some surgical correction at this site? The third question also is an OSCE question. This is a 30 year old farmer here. Yeah? And uh, uh, he is also a tractor driver. And he presented with his chronic uh, legion in his right foot. It is discharging black grains and uh, from uh, the dorsal and plantar surface of the foot. Now, what is the most likely diagnosis? And what is the most important uh, investigations at this stage? And what is the appropriate treatment at this stage? And how would you uh, communicate this to him that he needs some sort of major surgery at this site because discharge and bones are involved and discharge in the ventral and in the, in the plantar and dorsal sides of the foot. It is a communication skill question. Now, this is the last question. This is a 40 year old tractor driver. He needs to press on the brake and on the benzene. Uh, he uh, uh, contain, uh, he complained of pain as the sole of the foot. On examination, there was a tender, firm swelling at the plantar aspect of the foot. It is tender to pressure only and during his walk. And mention three possible causes for this swelling and mention one uh, investigation that may help in reaching the diagnosis, and what would be as a treatment for this patient, and how would you communicate this for him, particularly being a driver? And this is again a communication skill question. Uh, to this point, I will stop, and I will see you in another lecture. I leave you in good health, great hopes. Bye-bye.